Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. The Old Testament book of Zechariah. Zechariah and chapter number 14. Zechariah and chapter number 14. We're progressing forward with our series of the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We had started the series by explaining terms and putting uh, (laughs) uh, explanations, trying to bring everybody on the same page so we could talk about the same things. Then we had started talking about the timeline of the events leading to the millennial kingdom, that we explained the rapture, that we went ahead and explained the tribulation. And now we are hitting a transitional passage, still talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to this earth to rule and reign forever. Now, as we progress forward on this, sometimes people also have a misunderstanding of the millennial kingdom, thinking that only prophetical events are in the New Testament only. Uh, That's something I'm finding quite often as people are now talking to me about these messages of the millennial kingdom, is that A lot of them only think that prophetical things are in the New Testament. And if they base their views of prophecy in the New Testament, they miss, as what we had said before, the framework of prophecy. And they become so far off because if you put a puzzle frame, you know that all the pieces of that puzzle have to fit inside of that frame. Well, without a frame, you start putting puzzle pieces and connecting them to places where they're not supposed to connect to. And there becomes a great confusion. A second observation is that a lot of people have an idea that the things about the millennial kingdom in heaven, that there's so few things said in some people's minds, that there's not a lot about it, and that it's more vague and then more open to interpretation. That is also incorrect. As we're going to see in our passage in Zechariah tonight, this passage is full of details about end time things, explaining in detail some of the things that God is going to be doing when he comes back to rule and to reign on this earth. So with that, hopefully now you have found the Old Testament book of Zechariah. It is second to last book in the Old Testament. The last book is Malachi. The book right before that is Zechariah. Zechariah in chapter number 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And if you don't mind, let's look at the word of God together. Let's look starting at verse number one. Zechariah chapter 14 and in verse number one. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city." Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall remove towards the north and half of it towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Aziel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with him, with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. 
But it shall be one day which thou shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In the summer and the winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Gibeah to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. From Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate from the tower of Hanel, unto the king's winepresses. And men shall dwell in it. And there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay a hold every one on the hand of his neighbor. And on the hand shall rise against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together. Gold and silver and apparel and in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse and of the mule and of the camel and of the ass. And all the beasts shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which shall come up against Jerusalem even shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, and it shall be that the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen and come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea or Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And of all they that sacrifice shall come and take care of them and seethe therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a special name of God that we find in the book of Zechariah chapter 14? Zechariah chapter 14, and notice the name of God listed in this passage, Jeremiah, uh, <laughs> Zechariah 14 and verse number 5. Notice the name of God, the Lord my God. In verse number 5, the Lord my God. God. Now, those who know me well know that I have a very interest in the names of God and a very special interest in this. The name of God used here is Jehovah El Hore, which means the Lord my God. For those of you who like spelling such things, it's Jehovah J E H O V A H, and then the next word L O A E L O H A Y. Jehovah Eloi. This is the Lord my God. And with the Lord's help, we want to study about the Lord my God from this passage in Zechariah chapter number 14 and see more the details that God gives concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't mind, let's go 
to the Lord and let's talk to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. Thank you for the great privilege it is to have your Bible, to see the details and what you explain is going to happen in concerning the future, concerning your coming, that we can have a better understanding and apply these things to our life. I thank you, God, that you know the end from the beginning and that you're able to give us these details and give it in such a way to be an encouragement to us. Fill me with your spirit for the purpose that you direct and organize. Make this clear. Make the path straight. Let it be easy to be understood. Thank you again for this privilege, Lord, but we need you. We need you to work. We need you to make things clear. We need your Holy Spirit to be working in the hearts of the listeners that we could discern this passage. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is not just a New Testament doctrine. Now we understand that the Old Testament saints did not know the name of Jesus, though they understood that God was coming back. And we have passages like this that proved it. Now these passages are all based off of promises that God had made to the people of Israel all the way back in the book of Genesis. And when you come to the minor prophets, there are 12 minor prophets. They're minor in size, but major in message. Most of the minor prophets will end up with a prophecy passage based off of the promises of God that God will return. And he uses those at the end of these minor prophets to encourage the people to look forward to the future that God is not done with them yet. Now, inside of the book of Zechariah, the context is also going to be important. At this time, the people (coughs) of Israel have disobeyed God so much that the kingdom has been divided into two places. You have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. The southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Well, after 6 70 years of captivity, God had allowed the Jewish people to come back to the city of Jerusalem for the purpose of rebuilding their temple the temple to the Lord. And as they begin to lay the foundation, opposition from the rest of the nations begin to come and they stop the work. Now 15 years have passed. The foundation of the house of God has been laid, but can you see in your mind where the plants have now overgrown? It's been neglected for 15 years and the people have been afraid. Now they're becoming excuses. They have all these reasons why they can't obey God. So God sends two preachers by the name of Haggai and Zechariah to preach to the people to encourage them to keep moving forward. And one of the fears that they have is the enemies that surround them. And so with this, God uses Zechariah to preach to them that it doesn't matter how many enemies you have against you. And yes, the enemies are real. Yes, the enemies want to destroy your city. They want to kill every single one of you. And if they have that way, they're going to wipe you off the map. But guess what? Your God is going to return and he's got a plan. And because he's got a plan, you need to continue on in this life, no matter who's surrounding you, no matter what oppositions you may have, you take the next step. You take the next step. You take the next step. And in Zechariah chapter number 14 is the culmination of this prophecy where he's giving them the hope God is coming back. The Lord is returning. The Lord, my God, has plans for you. And so with this, let's learn more about the Lord, my God, and his plans for the future. Notice, first of all, the Lord, my God, is coming back. The Lord, my God, is coming back. Notice with me in verse 1, Zechariah chapter 14 in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now remember this phrase, the day of the Lord, you see that a lot in prophecy. The day of the Lord carries the idea that the day of Jesus Christ coming back. It deals with Christ's second return. When you see the phrase, the day of God, it's referring to the day of judgment that comes. 
But the day of the Lord is when Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming. God has promised it all the way throughout the Old Testament. They may not have known the name of Christ, but God speaks about this return quite often. And here, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided from the midst of thee. At the time where the Jewish people are in the most trouble, that's when Jesus Christ is going to be coming back. Here, it's talking about the end times. We've already made mention of this dealing with the tribulation. Notice in verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the people. Now remember, we have spoke about this, that in the tribulation events, the Antichrist, who's, who um, is going to sit down on the newly rebuilt temple, the Bible refers to this in multiple passages as the abomination of desolation. It is at this point that the Jewish people are going to realize the Antichrist was not the Messiah that they had been waiting for, that Jesus was the Messiah. And so as they reject the Antichrist in mass, there's going to be a persecution upon the Jewish people like no other. And we see that in verse 2, that Jerusalem is just going to be taken over. As the people are fleeing and trying to run away from the persecution, the people that are left behind are going to be captured. They're going to be ravished. They're going to be destroyed. It's going to be a horrible time. Again, notice in verse 2 in that light. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And so remember that the Antichrist is going to send a great persecution against the Hebrew people. Then the Antichrist, in a way to challenge against God, is going to gather up all of the armies of the world for one final assault against God to destroy God's people, his chosen people. And it looks like as the chosen people are surrounded, it looks like they're going to be wiped off the map. In the time they're in the most despair, verse 3, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 3 says, guess what? In the midst of all of that time, that's when Jesus is coming back. That's when the Lord is coming back. Notice it gives a specific place Christ is coming back in verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day. Which day? The day of the Lord. The day that the Lord cometh. The day Jesus comes back. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So let's pause here. We have hit this message before that in Acts chapter uh, 1, that when Jesus finished uh, giving instructions to the disciples, Jesus opened up his arms and ascended up to heaven. And all of the disciples are staring up looking and looking, trying to find, is he coming back down? What's going on? And God had to send two angels to come and kick him and say, hey, what are you guys staring at? And, uh, and then the angel said, this same Jesus shall come in like manner. What does that like manner mean? It means the very same way. This same Jesus, not a clone Jesus, not a doppelganger Jesus, not a different Jesus with the same name. That same Jesus is coming back. And the same way he went up is the same way he came back down. That Jesus Christ, he went up physically. Jesus Christ is coming back physically. Jesus went up literally. He's coming back literally. The very same way Jesus went up he went back down. Jesus went up bodily. He's coming back bodily. By the way, this same Jesus is coming back in the same place. In Acts chapter 1, where did Jesus ascend up to heaven? The Mount of Olives. According to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, where is Jesus landing back? The same exact spot. The Mount of Olives, which is to the east of Jerusalem. It's almost like God knew what he was talking about. 
And Jesus Christ is going to come back. Notice how hard he hits. And verse 4, and his feet shall stand that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, on the Mount of Olives, shall cleave, that means cut in two, in the midst thereof towards the sea and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half shall come to the south. By the way, how hard do you have to hit to cut a mountain in two? Pretty hard. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back from heaven. He hits, by the way, we're coming with him. And Jesus Christ lands and he, he <laughs> redoes the geography of that whole place. Mount Jerusalem is going to raise up to like a plateau and there's going to be a river that's going to flow from it. The whole thing is going to expand. It is going to be just totally, when he lands, it changes everything. He hits that hard. And when God himself touches on earth and all of his glory, not robed in flesh, but on his glory, all of nature is going to pay attention and respond. Verse number five. And ye shall flee for the valley of the mountain, for the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azrael. And ye shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come. Notice this. And all the saints with thee. That's us. We're coming back. By the way, that's an Old Testament passage that says we're coming back. Isn't that a blessing? Even the Old Testament says we're coming back with him. So Jesus Christ comes back riding a white horse. Revolution chapter 19 explains this in more detail. We as the saints come back with him, ready to rule and reign with Christ as Christ is coming back to set up his kingdom. Our Lord is coming back. All of those people have been raptured and have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. They're returning back with their redeemed bodies ready to rule and reign and everything changes. What all changes? Well, Garden of Eden conditions are going to be reestablished. So how God created the earth in the very first place before the first man, er, first woman ate the first man of house and home and just wrecked the whole thing. God is going to reestablish Garden of Eden conditions. Again, when the king of glory steps down, all of nature is going to respond to God in all of his glory here on earth and the earth is going to be removed from its curse and all of Garden of Eden conditions are going to be reestablished and go around the world. A great earthquake as nature is now responding back to God. It's amazing. Notice as it explains a little bit more about these conditions. Notice with me in verse 6 and 7. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass at the evening time, it shall be light. Now in this passage here, it's talking about some of those Garden of Eden conditions. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this message on the Garden of Eden conditions, but I want you to come at the end of May when we have a very special message on a Sunday morning about what was the Garden of Eden like, where I will explain all of these de uh, conditions in detail and explain all of this. But this is one of them. That in the Garden of Eden, because of the canopy that was surrounding the earth that acted in a fiber optic state, that it got to the place that in the middle of the night, because the sun is shining on the canopy and reflecting it to the other side, the darkest it would ever get at night was like a magenta peak, like at dusk. You never had to fear the dark anymore. And so when God comes back, one of the things he does is he sets up a condition where there's no more darkness. You could still sleep in it, but you don't have to fear the dark anymore. Now, God is setting up all of this. At this time, the people, at the time of the writing of Zechariah, the people are afraid of the enemies. The context of Zechariah and its prophecy is that all the armies of the world are trying to destroy the Jewish people. But when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be such a change because he is God. You no longer have to be afraid anymore. That's the God that we have. He's the God that's able to take away all of our fears. No wonder in the Bible there are about 365 fear nots. I'm so thankful that we have a God that is a real God that can help take away our fears as long as we're looking at him. 
Oh, what a wonderful prophecy. What an encouragement it was to these Hebrew people to know that there's a God that's going to take away all of their fears and that the enemies don't stand up against this God. And that even night itself will no longer be a frightening place. We don't have to be afraid of the dark. But it goes on, verse number 8. And it shall be in that day that the living water shall go out from Jerusalem. Half of them towards the former sea, half of them towards the hinder sea. And the summer and winter shall it be. Now, this is a big deal. This is where Bible geography comes to place. Today, Jerusalem is in what is called a desert. It is an arid place. It is a desert. And in addition, there are no bodies of water near Jerusalem. Jerusalem is right in the middle of hill country. There are no rivers running by it. There are no streams running by it. In fact, the way that Jerusalem gets its water is that underneath the hills, there is a spring, the spring of Gihon, Gihon, where they actually have to go down to get the water for the rest of the city. It is not a place with running water. But when Jesus Christ comes back, redoes all the real estate, and of course he's going to set up his temple. We're going to see this in a future message towards the end. That Jesus Christ is going to build his temple. And from this temple, there's going to be this river that runs through it. A living water that everything it touches, by the way, it's going to have healing properties. It's going to heal the land. There's going to be streams in the desert. That this desert place, this a place of the Middle East, which you think of it, you think deserts and sand dunes, it's going to be like a garden when Christ comes back. You see, all of nature is going to respond to God coming down on earth in all of his glory and his majesty. All of nature will respond to him in this kingdom. And there will be a major river flowing from Jerusalem to the rest of this area. Again, we'll cover this in detail later. But it's interesting that it's mentioned here. I'm so thankful that the Bible is so detailed that passage after passage, there are all these details and they all line up. Just like God said. Notice as it goes on, verse number 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. See, when Jesus Christ comes back, he is going to establish his reign on earth. The thousand year reign of Christ and Jesus Christ will be the supreme Lord, the supreme king over all of the earth starting that day. The millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ is where Jesus Christ will rule his kingdom over all the earth. Notice as it goes on. Verse 10. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Gibeah to Rimmon south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up, and the inhabitants in her place, and Benjamin's gates to the place of the first gates in the corner, and from the tower of Hanel to the king's winepress. The Bible speaks more about this later on, but all of the geography is going to change that Jerusalem is actually going to cover from the place of the Euphrates River all the way deep into the Mediterranean Sea, all the way up to the Black Sea, all the way down to the Red Sea. That's all Jerusalem. That whole plain is going to be risen up. All of the real estate's going to be changed. The Bible speaks about this in detail later on. Verse number 11. And men shall dwell in it. In what? Jerusalem. And there shall be no more utter destruction. But notice this. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. You know, one of the reports that we hear in the news all the time is the missiles and the bombs going off in Jerusalem. Could you imagine one day there will be a place where Jerusalem will be safely inhabited? No more car bombs, no more boss bombs, no more bombs in the market, no more uh, missiles coming over from (laughs) the other side. No more fear. It will be safely inhabited. Oh, what a great comfort it was to those Hebrew people that here, they don't even have a wall around their city at this time. And they're, tr- they're trying to rebuild the, the, the temple, but they have all these enemies saying, if you try to build it, we're going to stop you. And there's no way to keep them out, no way to stop them. And God says, do it anyways, because I'm in charge and I've got plans and I'm going to protect you. You keep going. 
the first thing that we see in this passage is the Lord my God is coming back. The Lord my God is coming back. But notice we see something else here. The Lord my God shall judge. The Lord my God shall judge. Notice with me in verse number 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Now what's happening is that it's rewinding. So it said the Lord's coming and when he comes he's setting up the millennial kingdom. This is what it's going to be like. But he's rewinding back to the initial conflict. Remember that in the future all of the Antichrist forces are going to be lined up to try to fight against God. And so Jesus Christ is going to come back and the armies are going to come back with him. And now all these armies are going to say, all right, Jesus, we're going to get rid of you and your people. We're destroying you. Now, notice this. Excuse the graphic nature, but let's see what it says. Verse number 12. And it shall be that this plague wherewith the Lord shall smite with all the people have fought against Jerusalem and their flesh shall consume away. While they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. So when Jesus Christ comes back. All he has to do is say a word. And all those frontline troops. An amazing display is going to happen. Their face is going to melt away. It's almost like watching some cheap animation from a movie. Where their face dissolves away. Their eyeballs kind of liquefy and dissolve away. Their tongue goes away. It is very graphic. It is horrifying. It is very horrifying. And by the way, Jesus didn't have to do anything but say a word. And all of a sudden people are melting. Now imagine that you're in this army. This great army. You're going to fight against God. The greatest army ever assembled. And Jesus comes back and devastates everything. He's got all these people coming back and Jesus just says a word. And the people in front of you just melt. Their faces just slosh off their face. And they just go, how would you respond? Would you kind of be horrified at this time? Would you kind of be, oops. Notice the response of the people who, who are watching their friends fade away. Next verse. Verse number 13, and it shall come to pass in that day, what day? The day that Jesus Christ comes back. A great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay a hold every one on the hand of their neighbor, and their hand shall rise up against the hand of the neighbor. What's going on? Well, when I watch Jesus say a word, and my buddies in front of me all melt away, I know one thing, I don't want to be up front anymore. I want to be back there. But when I turn around, I've got all these people in my way. And they're running too slow. It's kind of like the old thing that if you get chased by a bear, you trip the other guy. That's the idea. So when I'm trying to run away and the guy in front of me is too slow, I'm going to shank that guy so I can get past him. And it's going to be, there's such a panic to get away, they're going to take out whoever's in their way so they can get away. And so people are melting people are getting shanked people they're just so frightened you know when people get in the mob mentality when they panic they don't care who they trample they don't care who's in their way the one thing in their mind i've got to escape i've got to escape and again if you just saw someone melt in front of you your first thing is let i'm getting out of here i'm not staying and panic happens and again we are the saints we haven't done nothing we're just watching Jesus just says a word, people's faces melt away. Then the rest of the army is running for their lives, shanking each other and killing each other as they're trying to get away from Jesus. And we're just watching. <laughs> Some big battle, they're all running. Notice as it goes on. Verse number 14. And Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. So as people are in a panic to get away, they're dropping anything and leaving behind anything that will hold them down. I am not going to carry a big treasure chest if I'm trying to flee from my life. I'm leaving that thing below. I'm not car carrying any supplies. I'm not carrying the armory. I'm getting as far as I can. And if anything's slowing me down, I'm dropping it. And so as all the people running away and killing each other, they leave behind all of these supplies. Now remember the people of Jerusalem 
the Jewish people have been hiding and fleeing and starving, just trying to save themselves from the great persecution of the Antichrist. Remember that the persecution of the Antichrist is going to be the worst persecution upon the Hebrew people, the Jewish people that they've ever seen. We've all seen pictures of the Holocaust. We've all seen pictures of the starving people who haven't eaten anything, sticks and bones. Do you think this would be a great treasure after all of this time to be freed from Auschwitz and find all of the German supplies just available? That would be a big miracle to them. That's exactly what's happening after the years of torture from the Antichrist and hiding and fleeting and, and there's no stores in the caves and you can't grow crops in the great caves and you've been just barely surviving and any time uh, <coughs> you poke your head out, they're just trying to lop it off. It's not a good time. And now with the Antichrist forces just <laughs> dissolving away, running away, shanking each other away, all of the supplies there are laying at their feet ready to have. They don't have to worry about trying to buy something. Everything is there now. God has already supplied it for them laying at their feet. What a great God. Now again, for a Jewish person who's worried about all the people out there, to hear that God is able to supply in amazing ways, isn't that a comfort to keep taking forward, to take the next step to see what God would have them to do next? Notice as it goes on, verse number 15. And so it shall be the plague of the horse and the mule and the camel and the ass and the beast that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to, Jerus uh, to worship the king and the Lord of hosts and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. Now, let me pause here. Now, in this time, we have two things that God prophesies for and that we're going to cover on Sunday night and next Wednesday night. This is going to be the parable of the wheat and the tares and the parable of the sheep and the goats. That at this time when Jesus Christ comes back, he is going to destroy anyone who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. So the millennial kingdom is going to start with no lost people. But there are going to be people who survive the tribulation who did not accept uh, the Antichrist lies. They had accepted Christ as their savior and they live through it. And they're going to be able to have kids. Remember that with the Garden of Eden conditions, people are going to live to be a thousand years old. So with very little deaths and a lot of births, the population is going to expand tremendously. This is why we, as the saints, are going to be necessary is that we're going to help rule and reign this population that continues to grow quickly. Now, as Jesus is now talking about his kingdom, as we're now fast forward into years, verse 16 now begins to describe some of this uh, governmental economy of what the people are supposed to do. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. So all of the nations are going to be required. Every person is going to be required to go to Jerusalem to pay obedience to worship Jesus Christ who is the king. Everyone is required to go. But now it starts to say, what happens if somebody doesn't? Because there's always going to be some of that. Well, what happens if somebody doesn't go? So God answers the question. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations, which came up against Jerusalem, shall even go from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep his feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of the families of the earth under Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So what's going to happen if somebody says, listen, I don't want to obey Jesus. I don't want to do what he says. God, who's now ruler of the earth says, guess what? There's going to be no rain, not only for you, but also for your people group. There's going to be a judgment that comes by. Everybody will obey Christ, but there's going to be consequences if someone decides not to, to get their attention. Notice it goes on. It gives another what if in a specific illustration. So it says, and if, so it's giving an example. So let's give an example that a certain family from 
Egypt. It's not giving a real example. It's giving a example of what would happen. So if, let's just say that a family in Egypt decided not to go up and came not and have no rain that there it shall be plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not to keep the feast of the tabernacles. Now what this is saying is that Jesus Christ is going to be firmly in control. He is going to be ruler of all, judge of all, and everyone is going to respond to Christ. Everyone has to acknowledge him as God. You say, but that's not right and that's not fair. Why not? He's God. Shouldn't we respond to him as God? He's the boss. Why shouldn't we? By the way, it's not a big deal to obey God if you love him. It's not a big deal to obey him. It is a problem of the heart anytime we don't want to obey God. If God gives you something simple like reading your Bible, if you don't want to read your Bible, there is something spiritually wrong with you. You are rebellious towards your king. Period. We like to make things complicated. God makes things simple. You obey me because that's what's right. Obey me because I'm God. Obey what I've given you to do. And if we love the Lord, it's not a big deal to obey God. We want to obey him. But if we don't want to obey God, there's something spiritually wrong. And at this time, because there's something spiritually wrong, God is going to put things in their life to show them there's something wrong. And God is the answer to everything. God is God. <clears throat> Notice as <coughs> we come to this, we have one more thing that we want to give an example to. Uh, notice in verse 18 as we finish this. Um, and if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that it have no rain, that it shall be plague, wherewith the Lord shall will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. Our, my, the Lord my God shall be the judge. One more thing I want to show you here, and that's the Lord my God is holy. The Lord my God is is holy. Notice now as we switch over to uh, verse number 20. <laughs> and in that day there shall be bells on the horses, holiness unto the Lord. Now this is a poetical phrase that is very uh, pictorial. Now remember in this time horses are usually used for warfare. And here it's giving the idea that these horses that were once used for warfare are now going to be used as banners celebrating God. If we could modernize it a little bit, we have tanks that are a big weapon of our warfare today. Well, in that time, you're not going to need tanks. So you know what you're going to use tanks are? For a big billboard. You'll be able to put a big sign on it. It's all it's going to be used for. Hey, glory to God. What a great God that you have. What it's talking about in a poetical visual way is that there's no more need of these weapons of warfare. Everything is going to be used to praise God and to glorify God and to honor God. Why? Because God is holy. Notice now as it kind of gives a different illustration. Let's read verse 20. It's going to be at the end of it. And in that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea, or Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. What we see in this passage here is that as holiness prevails that all the instruments are going to be used to show, to be used for God's glory. Even mundane things like a pot, like something you'd boil water for. In your own house, it's going to be used to glorify God. When I'm boiling this pot to make me some food, praise God that I've given this. Everything that you have is going to be dedicated to God. Everything that you have is going to be used to glorify God. By the way, that's how Christians should live now. That whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, do all to the glory of God. You should be able to make supper for your family to glorify God. Praise the Lord that God has given us something tonight. And that I have the privilege of giving them something to feed my family. What a great God that we have.
Praise the Lord, I get to go to work and I have the privilege of laboring and using my strength to provide for my family, to provide these things so I can have more money to give to missions and to give to the church and that God could use us in a special way. Praise the Lord, I have an opportunity to glorify God today. Praise the Lord that when I rest tonight that I could trust God to give me the rest that I need to wake up in the morning and serve Him. Praise the Lord, I have an opportunity to go to school, to learn some things And to be able to trust God to develop some discipline in me. To be able to use later on in life. Praise the Lord that I get to read a book. And that God's going to use these things that I'm going to learn from this book. To be able to praise Him. Everything in our life is going to be made to praise God and to glorify God. And it's starting to bring a case here. If that's going to happen in the future. Shouldn't we start doing stuff like that now? Shouldn't we glorify God with everything that we do? That whatsoever we eat, whatsoever we drink, do all to the glory of God. This is the idea that in that time, everything you do is going to glorify God. Imagine how our life would change if everything we did was dedicated to God. God, I'm going to ask that you bless this movie that I watch. Oh, maybe this isn't glorifying to you. Lord, (laughs) I want you to bless this music I'm fixing to listen to. Well, maybe I shouldn't listen to this song. It's not glorifying to you. You know, that changes everything. It changes how we take care of our bodies. Lord, let me use my body to your glory and to your honor. Lord, help me to use my job for your glory and for your honor. Lord, let me use my testimony as I drive to be a testimony and the glory and honor to you. Whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, do all to the glory of God. This is what it's speaking about. That there's not going to be a mundane pan. This is going to be a pan that's dedicated to God to be served for him. There's not a fork in your house that wouldn't be dedicated to God. Praise the Lord for this fork and the food that God supplied for it. And that God could use this fork to feed me, to strengthen me for what God has me to do. Everything will be used to glory God then. Might as well start now. And the things that you do, can they be used to glorify God now? Notice as it goes on at the end of 21. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and every and in Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts, that they sacrifice shall come and take them and see therein. And in that day... There should be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, what does this mean? Now, the idea of a Canaanite is, uh, is an example of someone who is not one of God's people, a foreigner. In this time, there's not going to be anyone who is not an unsanctified foreigner. We're all going to be the people of God because we've all had to trust Christ as our personal Savior. We had to trust Him as Savior. We're now part of God's family. Every one of us get the privilege of going and worshiping God. None of us are going to be cast out. All of us have that privilege of serving God. There will be no Canaanite there. Again, it's another poetical way of saying all the people are going to be accepted and invited. Nobody's going to be outcast. Nobody's going to set aside. All of us have the privilege of worshiping God and living our gods to Him. Now, the purpose of this end prophecy was to encourage holiness now. To live as we should follow Jesus now. Because one day we will be the people of God forever. You listen very well. Let me do a New Testament application. First John, if you don't mind. The book of First John, chapter number 3. <clears throat> I'm so thankful that the Bible is consistent, even in prophecies, that there's no contradicting prophecies, but they're all pieced together beautifully. God knows what he's doing. We know that there's some prophecies that may give more details or flesh it out a little bit more, but there are other passages that, that give a spiritual application to these things that are said. First John chapter 3 is one of those passages. Notice with me 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 1, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. 
Oh, that should be something that should be exclaimed. Behold, what manner of love? Jesus died on the cross for us. What type of love is that? It is an amazing love. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. You know what a great privilege it is to be a child of the King, a child of God, because Jesus shed his blood. That's how come we get to be in the palace of the King, not because of us and not because of our birth, because of what Jesus Christ did. What an amazing love that is. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, currently, present tense, we are the sons of God. Right now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a child of the King. You are a child of God, present tense. But notice this, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. You know, one day we're going to get a brand new redeemed body and you say, preacher, what is it going to be like? I don't know. And neither do you. The Bible tells us a little bit, but we don't know. We can't even fathom and imagine what our brand new redeemed bodies will be like. We can't even imagine what we're going to be like when Jesus appears and gives us a brand new body. We don't know what it's going to be like. That's what it's saying. We, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. When we get changed, we, we just can't fathom it. But guess what? We will all be changed. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. How are we going to see him? We're going to see him God, not robed in flesh, but God in all of his glory. And when he comes back, we're taking up. We're going to get a brand new body. We don't know what we're going to be like. But one thing we know, we're going to see him as he is. We as redeemed man will be able to look at God, our creator, with our own eyes. With our brand new redeemed eyes. And we're going to be with him and we're going to know him and we're going to have a fellowship. Praise the Lord. Verse number three. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If we truly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back and that we're going to be like him and that we're going to stand before him and give an account, then the application is, is if we truly believe that Jesus is coming back and we truly believe that we're saved, we should start behaving like we're saved now. We should start applying ourselves to holiness now. Someone asked me yesterday, uh, someone not in the church, uh, someone outside, but they asked a very great question. What is the purpose of holiness? That is a great question. The purpose of holiness is that God desires to have fellowship with man. But sin has put a distance between us and God. That's why Jesus died to restore that fellowship. However, God is always holy and he cannot relinquish his holiness. So God cannot lower his holiness to come to us. We have to become more holy to become like him, to come to him. This is why it's important that we read our Bible so we could start getting closer to him. This is why we start obeying him and the things he's given so we could be closer to him. This is why we develop standards in our life and avoid things and avoid sin so we could become more like him, so we could go to him, so we could have a better fellowship with him. If one day I'm going to stand with God and be with God and have fellowship with God and rule and reign with God forever, I might as well start practicing now. And it should change my life if I truly believe Jesus is coming back and I truly believe he's going to be my judge and I truly believe he's going to change me and forgive me like he, or <laughs> like he promised he would then I need to respond to him now. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That word pure is carrying with that idea of holy. The Bible says in 1 Peter, be ye holy as I am holy. That God cannot lower his holiness to come to us. We are expected to raise our holiness to be with him, to have fellowship with him. That was the whole point of that Zechariah passage. He was trying to say, listen, I've got you taken care of. I've got the future there. I've got promises for you. Right now, 
you start getting closer to me. Right now, you get closer to me. I'll take care of them. I'll take care of the outside. I'll take care of the opposition. I've got plans for you. Right now, obey what I told you to do. Right now, get closer to me. Right now, have fellowship with me. Right now, you get closer to me. That's your job. My job's to take care of the outside. You take care of the inside. Be holy as I am holy. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whatsoever I eat, whatsoever I drink, do all to the glory of God. Could that be said of your life? That the things that you do in your life, even the mundane everyday things, could they be used to glorify God? Or do you have a lot of places in your life where you say, that's not God's, it's mine. He can't have it. This is mine. Are you at the place now? Or perhaps there's some things you need to turn over to God and say, God, you can have my life. There's a song by Fanny Crosby, Take My Life and Let It Be. (coughs) It's Francis Havergal, forgive me. Let me pull up the words for you. Frances Havigal, when she was writing this song, it's a dedication song. Uh, uh, <laughs> and um, she was writing it. And in the middle of it, she got stumped. She did, couldn't figure out what it was. And it was in the midst of this that God pointed out that, you know what? You've never given your silverware to me, your forks and your knives. You never dedicated them to me to use for my glory and my honor. She immediately went inside, took all of her silverware off, dedicated them. Lord, use these forks for your glory. Use these spoons for your glory. Let the things in here be pleasing to you. And she went back out and wrote that third song. (laughs) Uh, It says, take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Not a mite would I behold. The whole song is all about this idea of dedicating ourselves to the Lord. Whatsoever I eat, whatsoever I drink, I do all to the glory of God. Take my life and let it be. Consecrate it, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. At the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing. Always, only... For my king, always only for my king. Take my love, my God, I pour. At thy feet, its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. Whatsoever I eat, whatsoever I drink, do all to the glory of God. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.